I believe introverts have a competitive advantage over extroverts when it comes to sales. If we think about introverts, what is it that introverts are really good at? Listening, staying silent, yes. holding space for other people, and asking questions. Those are powerful skills. And so if we look at what is sales process, it's exactly the same. Staying silent, asking questions, and listening. In today's world, in 2024, where a lot of competition out there, so many people have a lot of subscribers, a lot of uh, followers, how somebody can build their personal brand. And so when the clients would ask me a question like, hey, uh, why should I work with you? I'm like, I have no idea. I'm not here to convince you to work with me. If you have a problem that I think I can solve, I'll tell you. If, if you don't, then I'll tell you also. I'm not auditioning for a role here. What role had podcasting played in your overall content creation journey, content strategies, and what benefit uh, has it brought into your own personal brand? Hi everyone, welcome to The Entrepreneur's Warrior Show. I'm your host Nilesh Jain and I'm super excited, happy to share with you that today we are recording 100th of episode of The Entrepreneur's Warrior Show and I'm so glad that we are able to achieve this milestone only because of you are continuously listening and all only because all the guests who is joining us because of their story continuously attending on this show, we are able to achieve this milestone and I'm super excited to host incredible guest on our 100th episode he is master at whatever he is doing he is like emmy award winning designer director ceo and chief strategist of blind and the founder of the future he is a futurist he, i he is inc 500 5000 recipient he have millions of followers and subscriber on all his social medias instagram linkedin and all of the platform youtube and he is a multiple seven figure entrepreneur and I'm super excited to host this particular podcast with none other than the legend Chris Do. Hi Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Good, good to meet you Neelish. I'm super excited with you. Your energy is like very calm, cool. I'm listening to you from a very uh, long period of time, learning a lot from you. I just feel like I'm talking with a monk, a monk in the entrepreneurship. And uh, you are a brand strategist, you are a motion graphic designer, a lot of things you have did over the period of time. You have a mission that you created like, okay, I wanted to inspire billions of people to turn their passion into sustainable careers. And when it comes to turn somebody's passion into sustainable career, there is a lot of things are required. So can you tell us this vision, like how somebody can do this and how did this vision comes in your mind like okay i wanted to walk on this mission vision i wanted to serve 1 billion people how did this vision come in your mind the origin of the the mission which is teach a billion people how to make a living doing what they love mm -hmm. came from a meeting with all my managers and i think we're transitioning from doing service design work to doing content and education and and my my team members like hey uh, chris what is it we're trying to do here? Because we want to help. Is it to sell courses? Is it is it to create coaching communities? What is it? And I thought about it. And then the next morning it came to me and I don't know if I was in the shower or not, whatever, but I came back into the, the, the room and I told them, I want to make it so that when you have children and they're of college age, they have a viable alternative to the education that they can get today at a fraction of the cost. And I said, it's too late for my kids. They're too old. We won't be, be ready in time. So it's for this future generation. And so Ben Burns, my chief operating officer, looks at me. And he has little girls that in 10, 15 years will be of age that they would, would be in college. And so he gets a little teary-eyed with me. He's an emotional guy, and I like it. And he's like saying, wow, I understand why we're doing this now. We're not doing this to make money. We're doing this to change the world. And so I needed to be able to tell that story in a succinct way instead of repeating this entire narrative. So I say, I'm, I'm here to teach or to help a billion people make a living doing what they love. So they have to acquire certain skill sets so that they can follow their passion and to live their fullest potential. And I think if more people did that, there would be a happier place, it'd be more productive and there'd be a lot more joy 
harmony and peace. Wow. Man, the thinking behind it is something very powerful, very deep. When you uh, said that, I learned it from my managers and I, that's where I decided like, okay, this is a vision I am developing over the period of time. It's something really inspiring. And being an entrepreneur, everybody have to have some kind of big vision over just a money, money making thing. That's how they can build a big brand, big businesses, right? And love the thinking you have, right? So you all talk a lot about uh, value-based pricing. And this is a topic that you discuss extensively. So can you like explain like how this approach different from traditional pricing models and why it's so beneficial for entrepreneurs to define that like, like they have to work on their value, not just uh, their product pricing? The, well, the origins of hourly based pricing comes from our long tradition of measuring worth against time or effort. And what we start to realize is that it's a poor measurement of what it is that we do and why we buy anything. The example I like to give to people is when you have a job to do, a repair roof, fix a leaky pipe or a faucet, or to, to, or to build a garden, you're not really trying to measure this person against time. Because if I don't get the result that I want, taking more time is actually a worse situation for me. Whereas if I get what I want and you do it in less time, it's worth more to me. Here's the classic scenario. Years ago, I think it was around 2006 or 2007, I bought a building and the building needed to be completely gutted and we have to put in a shell and a core, we have to revise the roof, put in air conditioning, electricity, and then build out the office. And my contractor said, it's going to take about a year to do this. And I was thinking, well, let's not take more than a year because every month that goes by, I'm paying mortgage on a building that I cannot use. I'm also paying property tax on a building I can't use. So as, as the project goes in, we also put into the contract every month or day, it goes beyond the specified date that you promised to deliver this, you're going to have to pay me. So there's a penalty clause and they have to accept that if they want to work with me, otherwise I'm gonna work with someone else. So in an instance like this, you can see very clearly the incentive the incentive is for them to finish, do a great job, but do it on time and keep things moving along. Since I don't know how to build a building, I don't know how to do electrical and plumbing, it's on them to manage the project well, not on me. So if they manage it well, they're going to get paid whatever they bid. And if they manage it poorly, they're going to lose money because they're going to have to pay me for missing the deadline. We can understand that, right? Like no one wants to pay for a building yes. they cannot use and that they're paying mortgage and taxes on. So I, I can even incentivize them with a bonus to say, if you finish three months early, I the money that I'm going to save in terms of being able to use the space, I'm happy to give you some of it. So now we switch into the creative role here. We say like, okay. And it's a weird anomaly that I think grew out from, from attorneys. Somewhere attorneys switched from billing against the value of a project to hourly billing. And because they are seen as professional people, this practice got adopted by lots of industries, including ours. And so now when, when we talk about creating a project for somebody, say a logo or website, we charge them based on how many hours we think it's going to take. And this is a real problem now because it doesn't account for experience, for the X factor of like whether I'm well known or if I've got a long history of doing great work or if the design is subjectively better than someone else's design. We're just measuring one thing, time. This is why we have to have a different conversation around how to charge for things and not base it on time. Man, <laughs> there's a lot of things. And even the story, when you share that one story, that is really deep and powerful. If uh, somebody can understand that they can define like whatever I am charging, how I am charging it and the way I am charging it. That's a really deep story. And now if we see in the create, creative world, even if it's come in a designing, branding, creative world, freelancing, entrepreneurship, AI is everywhere. There's a lot of debate about AI, whether it's uh, making people lazy or not. If our uh, people are going to lose their job, 
there's a lot of positive around it there's a lot of negative around it so what is your take on this like what do you think is it really making people lazy or is it helping them in their business in positive way in negative way what is your take on this ai thing yeah i think to say that something makes you do something is to say i have no agency over my life i have no self control i have no autonomy to make decisions and and to do things you know a couple of years ago unfortunately we had to go through this global pandemic when yeah. the coronavirus basically made a lot of people sick and it 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 brought industry to a halt and businesses yeah. have not fully recovered from this so you can say like the the pandemic ruined businesses and i don't think it ruined anything what it did was it accelerated the timetable so working in commercial office spaces might have been a thing that was its time was overdue remote based working was on the rise in terms of the trend and it just accelerated it so once the pandemic hit we started to switch certain companies did really well and some companies went out of business because they were out of business to begin with i don't think ai can make you lazy it can't make you productive it can't make you smart it can't make you dumb i think what it does is it reveals and accelerates this that concept so if you're a lazy person you use tools to be con continue to be lazy if you're a productive person who wants to work and has ideas ai will just make you more productive to help you generate more ideas so it doesn't make you do anything definitely the how you use tool is a, is defined your like outcome the way you use any platform is going to define like how you are going to get result in your life or the way you are going to use it that's a definitely a deep meaning wow <laughs> well let's 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 expand on that nilesh yes please go for it um let's say you're 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 inspired by this amazing artist and they have paints and brushes and a palette knife and canvas well we can give you all the same tools are you going to be a great artist probably not unless you're already a great artist yeah we can take the camera and the lens from an amazing photographer and the lights and give it to you are you going to become an amazing photographer no because the tools don't make you the artist makes the tool the tool doesn't make the artist so we're talking about ai or we're talking about desktop publishing or video or social media none of it makes you do anything it's you who makes it so I don't understand the logic that people have where they say, well, AI is going to ruin people. It's like, no, I think they're going to be ruined. AI is just going to accelerate that. That's definitely true, 100%. Even I'm using a lot of AI tool in my own business in might be some video editing, some kind of generating graphics, some kind of generating scripts, helping in so many ways and it is saving a lot of my time and i when you said it helping you to grow your productivity it's 100% true now let's uh, talk about like content creation personal branding you are yourself a content creator you are talking a lot about personal branding in today's world in 2024 like where a lot of competition out there so many people have a lot of subscriber a lot of uh, followers how someone can create or grow their personal brand from scratch how somebody can build their personal brand and so if we want to build a personal brand and i think personal brand is one of the most important concepts in the in in the last 10 years and perhaps the next 50 years i'm not sure but if we want to build one what do we have to do well we have to be able to have something to say we have to be able to inspire or entertain people so that they look at us as the source of that information now the world is drowning in information we're over communicated to and so that means that information is not as valuable as it used to be if you look at it historically speaking universities were the gatekeepers of information you would go to university yes. you have this amazing library access to professors and then they would teach you but when information is so readily available outside of that does that mean universities have no value no they still have value because now yes. they become the curators of the information to say like you can read 500 books on these two subjects or you can read the three that we know are the best books and we'll teach it to you in a way that you're not going to get from somebody else and so when we transfer that idea of the university as being the curator of information or knowledge then we can say well people can be curators of information and knowledge as well so if you like me if you like my perspective 
like the way I think or the way I communicate, or maybe just the, the tone of my voice or the way my face is shaped, then you're more likely going to listen to me than someone else. So I've done the work right. for you. True. I've read the books, I've watched the videos, I've curated it, and I've said, this is what you need to hear or to learn or to listen to at this moment in time. And then you find value in that. And so the person who was able to bring an audience together creates the person who's able to bring the audience together creates tremendous value for both the audience and for themselves. Because now marketers, advertisers and companies say, we love the audience, the community that you've built. We'd like to talk to them through you. So then they give you money to talk about the things that you care about. And then we all help each other in that kind of ecosystem. Definitely. The way you adding value in the marketplace, the way you providing information is how you are influencing people. Is it positively? Is it negatively? And that's how you are building your personal brand over the period of time. That's a, something very much insight. So when somebody is building their personal brand, there is so many things they have to keep in mind. So what are some of the common mistakes people are following, people are doing when they are on the journey to building their personal brand? Whatever the mistake that you see over the period of time, people are doing same mistake when they are building their personal brand. The number one biggest mistake that people make when they build their personal brand is to not to be authentic. And it's a term that people use a lot, but I don't know if everybody has the same understanding of it. So let's figure this out. What does it mean to be authentic? Authenticity is who you are when no one's watching. Okay, it's who you are when no one's watching. And so what happens in social media is we start to edit and curate our lives such that it's no longer a reflection of who we really are. And to be honest, we all do it to a degree, but the gap in which be, that exists between who you are when no one's watching and who you show up and pretend to be, the bigger the gap, the less authentic you are. Like for example, if I show up on this interview today and I'm unshaven, I haven't showered, or I, I, I look really disheveled because that's just how I am normally, you might not take me seriously. You might say like, Chris, you're not really showing up to be a professional. Or if my microphone is terrible or the lighting is bad, you were like, well, I don't know what's going on. So there is some degree of showing up. But if I go on and say, if I have certain beliefs and views about things and I change what I say, so that you will accept me that I'm creating a persona, a version of myself to be accepted. And this is how I see most people do it. They show up as some fake version of themselves, a persona, because they're afraid that when people find out who they are and what their beliefs and values are, that they'll no longer care. So now what you have is you have an audience who shows up who doesn't really know who you are, and it's not really you anyways. And so you're perpetuating some kind of myth. And that's the exact opposite of how you build a personal brand. Number two is the motivation. I think a lot of people build a personal brand because the first they don't understand what it is, but what they're trying to do is to market their products or services. So it's a veil and it's a thinly veiled thing that they put up. Like, this is who I am. Oh, by the way, buy this. This is who I am, buy this, buy this, buy this. So what happens is when we teach, when we present, we give value. And when we pitch, yes. we take it back. It works against the, the, the opposite kind of spectrum of creating or taking away goodwill. So if I show up every single day and I try to help people, that's going to generate positive feelings, sentiments, goodwill. If I keep pitching, I erode the goodwill until there's no goodwill left and people get tired of you because you're pitching all the time. So the, I would say like those are two of the biggest mistakes. So number three is we think we can just figure it out. Sometimes we can, but what we need to do is we need to get help. And the way I would suggest people get help with this is the number one thing, and I've said this before, is to go and see a therapist, to get in touch with who you are, to work out your inner demons so that you can let go of this persona, this facade that you show up as, and to start to reveal your true self. You probably need to take some writing courses or learn how to write so that you can clearly articulate your ideas in ways that are more likely to be read and shared. Those are a couple of things I would do. Number one, authentic, be authentic. How you are showing up in your personal life, show same way in social media. Every time if you are just thinking like, okay, I wanted to pitch this guy something, that's not you are building your personal brand. You are just a money-minded person who is always running behind money like okay 
I want to sell this person something and I wanted to get that something from out of them. And third is not asking for help. That I love this quote. Like if you don't ask, the answer is always no. If you are going to ask, people are going to help you. That's three very powerful things which everybody have to follow in order to become a really great personal brand and avoid this three mistake. That's really beautiful. While you are talking like uh, about authenticity, then pitching, then asking for help, you are talking a lot about sales call. And I see so many sales call role play of yours on your YouTube channel. And I really want to salute you for the things that you are doing. Like your every video is a kind of masterclass that help me and a lot of people. How people can avoid being a shyness, being a not straightforward being introvert how somebody can develop a really good mindset that they can become a great salesperson and they can sell their product very easily calm cool how they can avoid all of the things um, like i'm a shy i'm an introvert i'm not good with it is how they can overcome the mindset they can work on this mindset okay it's very easy i believe introverts have a competitive advantage over extroverts when it comes to sales if we think about introverts, what is it that introverts are really good at? Listening, staying silent, yes. holding space for other people, yes, and asking questions. Mm. Those are powerful skills. And so if we look at what is sales process, it's exactly the same. Staying silent, asking questions, and listening. We think we, we, we have examples of role models where they're using psychological tools to leverage people, to manipulate them, to get a positive outcome for themselves. And we think, well, I don't want to do that. That's disconnected to who I am. And it should yes. be disconnected to who you are because it's not a good thing to do. So I find that the most powerful sales process and technique is number one, to have the mindset of servitude. I'm here to serve the other person. Sometimes I have the answer and sometimes I don't. I don't need to be honest about that. And then we have to know that we are not just auditioning for a role, but they're auditioning to be our client. And there's something that Blair N says, and he's quoting someone else when he says this, that you are the prize, that the clients have fewer options of people to solve their problem than you have sources of income. But what we do is we enter the conversation and we, we feel as if we have no power and we, we act needy and desperate. When in fact, we have lots of power, at least equal amount of power, and to hold this idea that I'm the prize. So for me, even early on when I was a new graduate, I thought, I do something good. In order for me to give you this gift, you have to recognize the gift, and you have to be in a position where you can pay for it. If you can't, I totally understand. You can't buy it, and it's not a problem for me. And so when the clients would ask me a question like, hey, uh, why should I work with you? I'm like, I have no idea. I'm not here to convince you to work with me. If you have a problem that I think I can solve, I'll tell you. If you don't, then I'll tell you also. I'm not auditioning for a role here. And it flips the power dynamic really fast. In fact, I encourage lots of people to try to kill the engagement such that they have to say like, no, no, I really want to do this with you specifically. Well, fantastic, let's continue talking. So if you build up your skill set such that you believe you could do something good, you'll have this mindset that matches the skill. So number one is learn the skill, practice your craft. Once you become confident in what you do, let that transfer over into how you have the sales conversation with the client to realize you have more options than they do. And then you can conduct yourself. You're both trying to determine if it's a good fit for each other. So the minute you stop pitching and presenting, that you start to gain leverage and ground on the negotiation of the sales. <laughs> I don't have a word to say, but that's a really powerful thing. Like master the craft and uh, the 10,000 hours learning any skill is something everybody can follow. If they can follow, it can help a lot, right? That's a beautiful thing. When I'm studying about you, you have 98,000 something on your Instagram in 2019, 98,000 uh, followers, right? And yep. in 2024, you have over uh, around 1 million followers. It's a 10x growth or more than that. So 
how did you create engaging content that actually helping you to grow this massively over the period of time and and it's a it's five years is a i don't say it's a very long time it's a, just a short period of time where you have achieved this milestone so how did you approach creating content that help you to grow this level can you talk about like how somebody can create an engaging content and how you did it what is your framework a strategy behind it okay i want to give credit where credit is due there's a couple of things that are happening that allow me to grow really fast and i'll tell you what they are yeah i was yeah. having a conversation with a guy named michael janda and i noticed that he had been growing pretty quickly and i yeah. was bothered by that because i didn't want him to catch up to me i was like i like michael but i'm like i don't want to get lapped by him and so i noticed he was doing these presentations on instagram we refer to them as carousels today but before i didn't know what they were it was right at the time when Instagram increased the number of slides that you can include in a post. It used to be three, and now they opened up to ten. In fact, they're working on opening up to even more slides now, which is happy for me, which is a happy thing for me. So what I, I what I could deduce from what Michael was doing was he was taking concepts from his book and and he was translating them to like this, these mini keynote presentations. And I was talking to him. I asked him lots of questions about it. And he goes, "Chris, you should do this." I'm like, "I should do this." In fact, I have, at that time, dozens, not 100, but dozens, maybe 30 or 40 <laughs> keynote presentations I've done. And so I would start to convert the keynote presentations into content, content that could be consumed. There was a real challenge here because when you make content for a presentation, you're talking. But when you're looking at a carousel, you're not doing any talking. So I had to kind of figure out, well, what is it that I was going to say about this slide that I can translate easily? The mistake that I made at the beginning was I tried to teach too much in the carousel and I think it was mentally fatiguing and and just it wasn't working. So I learned the lesson that if you make the the content light enough that it's fun and they can move through it and they can learn something quickly, then you've done something good. Yes. So as soon as I started doing that and doing it on a consistent basis, like three to four posts a day, my account started to grow really fast. And I kept doing this for a period of about two weeks. And I picked up something like 20,000 new followers in two weeks, which was yeah. crazy for me because I i don't even know if I had 20,000 followers at that point. Mm, yeah. Just And I did it in two weeks. So now I kind of knew the formula. So I just kept doing it for a period of time. The problem is it's all kind of consuming. Like how you can write four posts, five posts a day. There's a lot to do. And so yes. I was ignoring running the company. I was just making carousel posts. The second thing that led to the growth was I started getting requests for guest posts. So I started featuring other people's posts on my timeline, which gave them new followers, but also got me new followers. So the combination of those two or three things happening at the same time allowed my account to grow really fast. Uh, the second feature you talk, uh, guest which post. is guest post, yeah. So it is kind of invite feature we have right now on Instagram. It's not a feature. What people would do is they would submit their slides to me. I would uh -huh. make comments and the ones that I liked, if it was approved by me, then I would then share on my feed. And then okay. I would tag them and mention this is a guest post by this person. Got so you. to date, some of the, my highest engaged, highest follower posts were not even created by me. They're created by other people. Mm. So the, the, the way that it works is they spend days, weeks, or months working on one post instead of like me doing five posts a day. So I can have their very best thinking and then I can bring it over. And sometimes I would redesign it or give them critique on how they can make it better. And then I would post it on my account. They would gain, gain followers and I would gain followers. Yeah, that's a, actually a very powerful point here is uh, even the people who have a good number of followers and subscribers and if you feel that they are a, they have your audience do collaborate with them kind of promote each other and that's how uh, it works by the way you talk about michael he's a uh, on our podcast i think three four weeks podcast back and he's definitely amazing what what at what he do so you mentioned i am published started publishing three four posts in a day five posts in a day that is consistency is a key for anything that uh, we want to achieve. Like uh, even if I wanted to achieve 
master my communication i have to be consistent even i want to master at any point consistency is often mentioned even in content creation as well so while being consistent how somebody can focus on consistently putting a lot of content without losing the quality yeah well when it comes to content and art i think quantity leads to quality that while you're trying to figure out what to do i think you just need to make lots of stuff so back in art school when we were working through an idea they would say make 50 thumbnails do 50 little concepts work through all the good ideas the typical ideas the expected ideas and eventually come to something that might be breakthrough for you and we we then somehow forget about that process and because now we're designing in public when we make something it's like it needs to be perfect so the perfection filter allows us to not make a lot of content and so how can we expect to grow we learn a lot by expressing and communicating and through repetition, we get better. So if you make one sculpture, you might be good. But if you make 100 sculptures, the probability of you being good is going to be much, much higher. In fact, there's a whole book written about this. And in terms of like the art experiments, it's the, called the fear of art. And, and in terms of like making pottery, the students who, who, were, who were tasked with making as many pots as possible versus the one that said just make one pot without like uh, without failure, all the students who were tasked with making more pots did higher quality, higher volume than the students who were just given the task of making one perfect pot. So this is kind of like the, the, the art experiment that I think has come to prove in itself to be true in many different ways. You get yes. good by doing something over and over again. So if you're going to write a post, make more posts. That's the way you get better. And eventually, the quality will come from the quantity. Well, you have to become expert at somewhere, do it over and over and over and over again. And that's how the quality is automatically coming out. The It is visible clearly like, okay, this person has uh, mastered his art and that's where it happened just because of his doing it consistently. That's beautiful. So you have had great success or I can say you are doing a lot interview podcasts. You are doing so many podcasts uh, with so many people. What role had uh, podcasting played in your overall content creation journey, content strategies that and what benefit uh, has it brought into your own personal brand or in your branding? Podcasts were a second thought for me because originally we we're creating content on YouTube. Yes. And so many of our audience were asking us, please make a podcast, please make a podcast. And I eventually I caved and I said, okay, fine, I'll make a podcast. So we took our YouTube episodes and we just converted them to audio only experiences. But I know something like a lot of what we do is visual. And so if somebody's just listening to this, they're not going to understand what's going on. So if I'm going to do something, let's try to make the content based on the platform to speak natively, if you will. So I started recording podcasts and eventually I'm making a lot more podcasts and being consistent with it helps for it to grow. How does it help me grow? Well, doing something on a regular basis allows you to improve. You don't have to be good when you start, but eventually you get better. And I start to learn how to conduct these conversations without having to do a lot of work myself. What's really cool for me as, as a human being is I get to talk to some of the smartest people, some of the people I admire the most, or people who have an interesting story to tell. So I can just get to learn about people and we can have a dialogue. Some of those dialogues or conversations turn into friendships and they transcend just being some, some person I meet online. So when we run into each other, there's a familiarity to it so that we might have dinner together and I won't feel so awkwardly weird because I'm an introvert. We've had conversations before. So podcasts for me have given me access to some of the most brilliant thinkers, people I admire, and I'm learning from them. I literally ask them, so if I'm doing this, what am I doing wrong? And they'll tell you. And that's that's pretty valuable advice that you're getting for free. Yeah, definitely it is. Right? Yeah. And then I get to honor them because if I'm a fan of what they're doing, I get to broadcast to this about 20,000 people and it's gonna move the needle. I think what people tell me is I discovered that person or that book because I heard them on your podcast. And so a lot of times authors will come up to me later and they'll say, you know, to this day, even though I wasn't on your podcast like over three years ago, 
I'm still getting people coming up to me in the street and saying, I know about you because of the future, because of Chris. And I think that's really cool. So I'm getting lots of value. I'm giving value at the same time. And you know what? The 20,000 or so people who listen to our podcast on the regular are taking along for the journey. Yeah. And they say, I love the way you ask questions. I love that you follow up with these things. And I appreciate that. And that helps me to build my audience. And the last thing I'll say about this is podcasts are a really powerful way to have an intimate connection with your audience because they're listening to it in their head. True. True. So yeah. people will literally tell me, I have dreams about you. I'm like, you do? How does that work? Well, I was listening to your podcast and I fell asleep and your voice and your yes. character and who you are continue on into my subconscious. Talk about a relationship with your audience. That is crazy to me. Crazy in a good way. Whatever you said, I am totally agree with you. I personally feel it because of the podcast that we are doing. And definitely because of the podcast, we are able to connect with a lot of like-minded people. We learn a lot from them. You, you mentioned one very good thing, which is you are asking very good question. I wanted to know your thought process, your back of the mind. What is how actually you prepare the for your podcast, how you are ask, asking questions, what is your thought process whenever you are asking any question to your guest or how you are preparing for your podcast? Yeah, I used to prepare a lot for the podcast. I used to try to read their book or watch videos or listen to other podcasts and I write all these notes. And then I found that when I was talking to the person, I could only do one of two things. I could either check my notes or I can listen to them. And so if I'm not listening to them, then I'm looking at the notes and I'm like, what is the notes telling me? Like, I'm here to talk to you. So I've chosen to go in this more conversational style of interviewing. So I do a little bit of research, like where they went to school, uh, if they have a degree in something, what their major accomplishments are. And then I just have a conversation with them. I forget the questions. The questions are like a safety net for me in case I don't know what to say. But most people that you have on your podcast, if you ask the right question, every answer allows you to ask more questions. And so rather than me going down a checklist of questions, I can just ask one question. And then from their answer, I can generate three, five more questions, which then generate three or five more questions. And there's no limit to that. I think that's more of the Joe Rogan approach, which is we're going to get together, we're going to have a conversation, and you get to be the best you possible. You don't have to talk about anything specific. There, This isn't like me trying to grill you. I'm not the IRS or the government. It's not the Federal yeah. Bureau of Investigation. I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. Mm. That's a really incredible thing. And definitely, if we just go in the conversation, if we just talk more about the person, like, okay, what is your thing? How you did it? And that's how we actually are able to master this conversation. We actually master this. Okay, that's going to be an incredible podcast. So uh, thank you so much for sharing this incredible nugget. You are in the journey from last uh, so long, right? So you have achieved a lot of success, a lot of fame. But what I am seeing in you is you are very calm, cool, humble, grounded, and focusing on your work. So how does it develop in you over the period of time? Like my goal is to make impact. My goal is to serve people. We discussed this at beginning of the podcast, but I wanted to understand more like how, how you are being very much grounded and humble but with having so much success. People are getting... People are like, okay, I'm, I have this much. They are showing off. Like they are, they have a lot of the ego in themselves. How you are so much grounded, calm, cool, uh, virtual or digi digital monk. Mm. I, well, I think the perception of me being a digital monk or being calm, cool or stoic or whatever words you might want to use is it comes from a place of high self-awareness. Like I know who I am. I know what I like. I know what I don't like. From the self-awareness leads to self-acceptance. Well, if I can't be different, then I accept this. And if you don't like it, I guess I have to be at peace with that. And I'm okay with that. And then from self-acceptance comes self-confidence to have this belief that I can solve problems. And I find that people who are really self-confident send out a different energy. They don't have anything to prove to you. They're not trying to gain favor or uh, to act differently around you to, to make you think differently about them that they become very attractive because we're, we're attracted to this kind of calm, inner peace energy. Conversely, if someone is insecure, 
like they think they're too short or too tall or too whatever the word might be, they start to overcompensate for that. So insecure people will go out of their way to put people down or to show off or to talk about all their accomplishments. And for a lot of people, it's like, I can see that you don't have to talk about it. And it's really annoying. So they, they wind up, instead of attracting people to them, they push people away. It's kind of repulsive. They're repelling people away. I just look at it like, you know what? In my life, where I'm at today, I've come, I'm at peace with who I am. If you don't like me, that's okay. If you love me, that's okay. None of it really matters because I know where I stand with myself. And I, it's something that I would like for more people to experience because it's it's a wonderful part of the journey when you can find it. I think uh, definitely I love you. You The thing that you are doing, it's really in admiring, incredible. So to being in the calm, cool position, peaceful mind, what kind of daily routine you are following? You are starting your day with meditation or any kind of daily rituals you are following for that? Um, they might come to a shock to some people, but I don't meditate at all. Okay. And my wife meditates all the time. And so she's deeply spiritual. So she always tells me, stop telling people you don't meditate. Just tell them you don't meditate in a traditional way. And maybe that's what it is. I, I wake up, I'm happy. I'm mostly happy all the time because I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful for all the things that I have, for the opportunities to get to talk to you and other people. So I'm trying to do my best to live 100% in the moment to be fully present. And it doesn't take a lot of effort for me. So it's like, I'm, I'm also not cursed with having so many different thoughts and ideas in my head. I'm a simple person. I have one thought, I have one narrative, one inner dialogue, and that's it. So I think people meditate because they have too many voices and too many different things going on. Luckily, by fate, by chance, by design, I don't have those voices in my head. When this kind of self-awareness is there, you can achieve anything that you are dream of. That's uh, really powerful. But uh, I just wanted to understand from you, might be I'm asking something not good for you, but have you ever feel insecure about your success and the fame you have on social media, if you ever feel it, how did you deal with this feeling? Like, what if I lose it? What if something happened? Did you ever feel this? I, I, no, I, I don't feel insecure about success or fame at yeah. all. I don't, yes. I don't really care. To care about these external markers is to say like, you're still not accepting of who you are. I think I have a following or I have fans because of who I am. I'll give you an example. I've told the story a couple of times. I was on a clubhouse call back when clubhouse was hot. Okay. And yeah. I have a strong opinion about lots of things and it can rub people the wrong way. And I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm not going out of my way to be malicious. I'm usually pretty careful with my words, but it makes people feel uncomfortable and that's okay. And so my friend calls me up and says, Hey, Chris, I think people misunderstand you that if you were just to tweak one or two things that you said, I think more people would accept and really appreciate you for the, the ways that I see you. And I said to my friend, reflecting on the conversation, I wouldn't have said anything different. I said exactly mm -hmm. what I needed to say. In fact, I, I have followers because I say it the way I say it. And trying to change myself to amend the way that I speak so I can get more followers or to get more fans means I've lost myself. And I think I will lose the followers. Not that the followers matter, but I am who I am, then the followers show up. The less I am who I am, the fewer the followers are. So am I worried about it? No, because it's a silly number anyways. It's, a, it's kind of an arbitrary thing. Right place, right time, right person gets followers. What does that matter? I'm more interested in making sure that I show up as myself and I speak whatever it is that's on my mind. And I'm not worried. If Instagram goes away tomorrow, LinkedIn or YouTube, I will still be who I am. I'm not going to think of myself as any less than that, nor do I think myself as more than just because I have more followers. It doesn't affect my internal compass of my inner self-worth. I think this is something everybody have to develop and definitely when this kind of thinking is uh, enter in human body or human mind, they can 
avoid any kind of negativity they can avoid like okay whatever i have i'm grateful whatever i don't have i'm grateful being grateful in the situation is something can help someone to grow faster than just being worried all the time like what if this happened what if that happened so uh, chris there is a lot of things out there you did so many things how you are planning to retain your legacy even after you leave this world how you are thinking to retain your legacy that you build over the period of time and that's a, a legacy that is inspiration for a lot of people including me how you are planning to retain it my my legacy only matters in two ways um, and they're my two children and that's all that matters to me but i believe that when i'm dead my life is over and no one's thinking about you and i couldn't even check if i wanted to there's no ability for me so i'm just trying to live my best life in the moment that i have and and try to impact as many people in a positive way as possible and when it's my time it's my time i don't really think about that much beyond that so i don't need to have a building or a collection of books that i've written because i want to live on some in some way that is not that doesn't matter to me now the good news is even when you don't try you're creating some kind of legacy right so yes. i've created over a thousand videos on youtube i've created over 1400 posts on instagram so if somebody wanted to look it up like if my children wanted to figure out who is dad what what were his thoughts on x y and z they could just literally look it up and in that way my ideas live on but i'm i'm clearly in the ground at this point and that was my shot we have this one shot i think it's important to emphasize this to people who keep thinking that they have these multiple lives to live and so they don't do the work that they need to do today in this life that they were given so tomorrow is an assumption i don't try and take that for granted today's the day so i tell some some people this and think you're so dark it's so macabre to think this way when i get on a plane i have a habit of doing two things i send a message to my family which is to my wife and my children we're on a group chat i say i love you i'm about to get on a plane and then I send one to my mom, same message. And then when I land, I tell them I've arrived. I look forward to seeing you again. And the reason why I do that is because I don't presume that the plane's going to land. I don't know if it'll land, but it gives me a lot of inner peace when there's turbulence and people are like, ah, oh, they're going all crazy. Why are they going crazy? They're going crazy because they fear that they're going to die and they haven't done the things they needed to do. But if you live your life to the fullest every single day, giving of yourself generously, loving without restrictions, unconditionally, and then what else is there left to do? So I don't want to leave anything on the table. I've said what I've said, I've done what I've done, and I've loved the way I've loved, and I'm, 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 I'm content with that. Wow. It's very deep. It's definitely a deep, if you, and it's all happened just because of when you master your own thought process when you master on yourself on your body in your mind on your heart so you are definitely i pray god you can live 100 plus years and right now you are i think 50 or more than 50 but you are not looking 50 so you are reverse aging so what is the daily routine you are following for your fitness for being healthy for being look like 20 20 year young boy okay uh, today i'm 52 years old and there are things that i do to try to maintain my health and my mind so people don't want to hear these things because they're like oh it's just genetics i think genetics plays a lot in this but if we take good care of our body food is medicine everybody so yes. when you eat poison you don't expect to get better you expect to get worse so I try and eat natural whole foods. I try to eat as few processed foods as possible. I do love bread, you know, I do love rice and I try to minimize that. I don't drink any alcohol, I've never have. I don't smoke, I don't do any drugs. And so I'm trying to live this clean life. I try to sleep when I'm tired, so I will nap when necessary. And I like to try to maintain some level of physical activity. So I have a home gym, I go for walks with my wife, I go hiking, those kinds of things keep my body engaged. And so I'm just trying to preserve this vessel that I have so that it's in good maintenance. And, and if you just do that, if you, if you wear moisturizer and sunblock, you don't try to like walk out in the hottest day possible, 
you know, it's one of these weird things. Like the what's necessary for life is also what destroys life. Yeah. Okay. Things don't live on earth without the sun, but with too much sun will destroy you. You cannot survive without water, but water yes. breaks everything down too. So it's kind of like this process we need to understand, like too much water on the soil erodes it. Too much water in your house will destroy everything. So water and sun will break everything down. So we kind of have to like learn to use this in the proper quantity at the proper exposure so that we don't destroy ourselves or the environment that we're in. And I just try to manage that. That's all. And you know, if you if you want to feel and look young, don't have old ideas. You know, old people oftentimes hold on to traditions and ideas that don't serve them. They're not as open minded. They don't have that kind of neuroplasticity that young people have. They've lost some of their curiosity. They live with dogma and it tends to kind of age you prematurely. And the last thing I'll say is if you're filled with purpose, like if your life has meaning to you, I think you are waking up every day with like extra energy because you, you want to go do something. If you take away your purpose and your meaning, maybe you don't get out of bed that day. Wow. It's really incredible. Talking to you was like, I'm talking to someone who is a uh, really amazing. I, I, I'm talking to my hero, by the way. <laughs> you inspire me a lot in so many ways in my journey when I'm starting my journey. It's like uh, I can talk with you continuously, go on and on, but time has its own limit. And in really incredible. Thank you so much for, from bottom of my heart for being on my show and uh, sharing your wisdom, sharing your nuggets with us uh, on our 100th episode. It's really a pleasure to host you. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any words for the listeners before we wrap up the show, what what's that? I think we, we unfortunately make too many decisions based on a fear mindset of a scarcity mindset. And if you were just to give yourself permission to go on an adventure, to risk being hurt in terms of love or life, I think the reward on the other side is well worth the risk that you perceive in your mind. And oftentimes the risk is so magnified in your mind, it prevents you from doing what it is that you want to do. And if you believe this, if you believe you have this one beautiful gift of called life, use the gift well, that's it. Beautiful. Thank you so much once again, Chris, for sharing this great analogy like how you are developing it and uh, everybody if you are watching this till uh, till this point please do share your love to chris and uh, i'm going to share all of the his social media link in the show notes i'll drop all of the links in the description you want you're mostly available on instagram linkedin where people can connect with you yeah you can find me on almost every social media platform linkedin instagram youtube twitter x TikTok threads, whatever. I'm at the Chris Doe, and Doe is spelled D O. D O, Doe. So, yes, I'll drop all the links in the show notes. Thank you so much once again for being here on the Entrepreneur's Warrior Show, and really grateful for all of you for supporting me on 100th episode in this journey. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Take care.